in the basis of success, the four qualities that are needed for concentration to succeed. The fourth one, we monk sa, has lots of different translations. Discrimination in the good sense of the term. In other words, having a discriminating palate is one. Analysis is another. The kind of never really explains it clearly, so there, there's room for lots of different interpretations. One of the Thai translations, and the one that John Lee uses a lot, corresponds to the English word circumspection. When you do something, you look all around. to see what the results are, and you don't jump to conclusions. You try things out, and you run with them for a while, and you see how they go. But just because something works once doesn't mean that it's always going to work. But at the same time, if something works for a while but then stops working for a while, it doesn't mean it's useless. You've got to remember, when was it working? Why was it working? and then file it away for the next time you might use it. So this is a quality we need as meditators. And looking around like this, you begin to see that some things that may not seem all that skillful to begin with can be put to a skillful purpose. There's a case where the Buddha talks about getting rid of anger, basically through spite. He says, you think about your enemy, and you don't tell yourself the person is not an enemy, the person really is an enemy. You say, well, this enemy would be really satisfied to see the stupid things I might do under the power of anger. So you restrain yourself, you hold yourself in check. So spite is not a skillful motivation, but it works in cases like that. So it's good to have that filed away, too. It's interesting to note how some of the Ajans use the image of a fighter as basic image for the practice. And some of them just talk about knocking out the enemy. Ajahn Lee, Tower talks about converting the enemy sometimes, if you can. You have to be careful. You have to be alert. But there are times when you can use your desires, use your, use your conceit, Use your craving for a good purpose. I don't know how many times I've heard people say, well, I shouldn't have preferences or I shouldn't have desires, so I'm just going to pretend like I don't have desires. As long as you're alive, you've got to have desires. The question is which ones are worth following and which ones are not, which requires that you step back a bit. Circumspection, looking around, also means you have to step back, because just because you like something You've got to watch out for the fact that it may color your perception of how things are actually turning out. So you need to develop the quality of the observer, the observer that can look around, step back, look around. And it's through having this ability to look at things from a different perspective, or from many different perspectives. That's how you develop your ingenuity. This is another way of, possible way of interpreting that fourth quality, that fourth base for success. They go together. When you look at things from different angles, you begin to see, well, maybe I could try this, maybe I could try that. You look at a John Lee's instructions on the breath. When I was in Singapore last year, there were some people complaining that a John Lee had introduced Brahmanical ideas into Buddhism where they didn't belong by talking about breath energies in the body. And the Buddha never said anything against breath energies, and he does talk about how the breath energy does fill the whole body. And there's a passage in the canon where the Buddha says, you gain a sense of well-being, a sense of rapture in the meditation, and then you let it spread throughout the body. He doesn't say how. He leaves it to your own ingenuity. It was a John Lee's ingenuity to figure out how to use the breath. And for a lot of us in the West, ideas of breath energy permeating the body are kind of strange. But as John Fuang said to me when I was first studying with him, it's how you feel the body right now. Think of that as breath. Hold that perception in mind. The feelings you've already got, you don't have to create new feelings. 
that if the sensation I have of, say, my arm or my torso or my feet or my head were breath, were an energy, what could I do with it? Because that's the advantage of this kind of perception. You can do things with these sensations that you couldn't do otherwise. If you perceive the body simply as a big solid lump, how would you spread rapture through it? How would you spread ease through it? But if you think about it as having energy channels, and then reminding yourself that when you sense the body, your first sensation of the body is of energy, then what does that do? What can you do with that? You can do a lot that you couldn't do with solids. So explore that. Hold that perception in mind. Think of this as an experiment. You're giving this perception a try. This too is a quality of circumspection. You don't just hold to an idea because you've been taught it for who knows how long. You test it, and you try to develop the qualities of mind that allow you to be a good judge of how you're testing it. And you find over time that holding the perception of your sensations as you feel them are related to breath energy. And it's a lot easier to let sensations spread through the body. And it's a lot easier to pick up where you're holding tension in the body unnecessarily. Now there will be some tension in maintaining an erect posture. But ask yourself, what's pulling me out of an erect posture right now? Which muscles are pulling to the left, to the right, forward, back? Which ones are making me hunch down right now? Can I relax them? Can I think of the breath going into them and relaxing them? You find there's a lot to do here at the present moment. Your sensation, your sensation of the body in the present moment. And doing that, you also get an insight into cause and effect. This is the other aspect of circumspection. Seeing that when you do X, what comes about? And then when you do Y, what comes about? And then you compare, which is better right now? And learn to see that what's better right now for one case might not be the same case tomorrow. That's why this is called circumspection. You're looking around to see what else influences the fact that, say, long breathing feels better today, or breathing in long and now short feels better today as opposed to tomorrow when it might not be so good. What's the difference? It's when you ask questions like this that you see things that have been going on for who knows how long, but you just haven't noticed your attention was someplace else, or you're asking other questions, or maybe you weren't even asking questions at all. So as the Buddha identifies it, that this factor of circumspection is Another way of saying discernment. And it's good to remember that discernment has this quality in all around us that looks for cause and effect, and looks for situations, looks for conditions. After all, the dependent core rising is an analysis of conditions. How do you think the Buddha arrived at that without experimenting, testing, trying things out? and seeing the variations that go from day to day. And John Mahabo makes a similar comment about dealing with pain. Sometimes you have a perception about pain that allows you to stay with the pain for long periods of time without feeling threatened by it. And then you find that tomorrow the same perception doesn't work. So you have to back off, look around again. What's different about this pain as opposed to yesterday's pain? And oftentimes the problem is not the pain in itself, it's the attitude you're bringing toward it. It was that questioning mind the first day that came up with the original perception. That's what you've got to nurture. So look at this quality of being willing to test, experiment, pass judgment on things, and test the judgments again. That's where the discernment comes in the practice, and that's what you start seeing results. 
it's not the case that we simply do concentration and then work on discernment. As the Buddha pointed out, doing concentration requires some insight into how the mind works, how it relates to the breath. For some people it's easier, they do less contemplation in that area. But that means that there will come a point where they'll have to start pushing the mind in that direction. But for most of us, it does require that we try to figure things out, think strategically about what it is in the mind that doesn't want to settle down and how can you get around it. And so step back, look around. And you end up seeing some things that you didn't see before, things that could be very useful. You may see some things that are not all that useful, but hey, that's what experimenting is all about finding out what does and doesn't work, and as for the things that work, when they work and when they won't. This base of success requires that some of your experiments will be failures, but if you know how to learn from failures, it all becomes part of your discernment. <laughs>